Let's begin here with the esteemed professor of U.S. government history and civics at Instagram University, Sharon mm-hmm. McMahon. Mm-hmm. Hello. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> it's, so, it's so great to be here. It, literally, as we be, hit record here, you've just completed your book, but we, I think we have four or five ideas for the next book. That's right. Just in our chit chat. That's how, absolutely right. How has the experience been? What's the thing that most surprised you? Uh, because you, uh, like me, spend uh, you know a good portion of time on the Instagram, mm-hmm. limited uh, space, limited text, uh, trying to summarize and give people the details in a very succinct way. Mm-hmm. And you have moved to the, the other end of the spectrum here in, in writing a book. So talk about mm-hmm. that experience, Sharon. It took a long time. It took much longer than writing social media posts. And there is this like kind of pressure of like, this is forever. You know, like there, there is no like, actually breaking news, going to update that story. The judge denied the request. Yes. You know, like there is no ability to just kind of like go back and amend. So there is this sort of weight of like, you better get this thing right. And it better be right for all time. So that there's like this a- a- added pressure. Plus there's a pressure of footnotes. Mm, there's there's like your, uh, all yeah, your sources, my sources. Every, yeah yeah there's like f- over 400 citations in this book so there's a lot of uh I, I felt a lot of uh pressure to make sure that i was uh getting all of the facts right i hired an independent fact checker to go through all of my citations to make sure that every single one said what i said it did and made sure that i was not uh, making inferences that didn't belong there just so that there was like this sort of independent, um, this independent verification. I sent it to multiple historians and was like, would you, what is, would you read this? And, Mm -hmm. uh, so they, that, that was, you know, like, it was just a lot of pressure to get it right. And I, I hope I've succeeded. I think you have. The book is The Small and Mighty, uh, 12 Unsung Americans Who Changed the Course of History. Uh, Sharon, America is about to turn 250 years old in the next it year is. and a half. It is. That's a lot of people uh, to think about as you chose 12. Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> how, how does one go about 12 choosing good ones. 12 people in 250 years of American history? Did you have some, some of the folks you feature here were, were they already like on a list of yours being like, I, if I write a book one day, I need to mention this person. Did you go in zero out of 12? Tell me about that process. Mm. Yeah, well, certainly there are more than 12 people worth writing about. Uh, And maybe someday I'll write about more of them. But for the purposes of this book, uh, it ended up being 12. And there were actually stories that ended up not making it in there. And maybe I'll save those for a rainy day. But um, some of them were people that have long fascinated me. Some of them are people. I'm like, that. you know what? That person is real interesting. Someday I need to do something with them. Mm -hmm. Um, other people I uncovered during the course of my research where I was like, didn't know about that. Or I, uh, you go in with 12, like you went in like totally open-minded, like I'm going to discover the 12 people. I went in with a, with a short list of people that I knew I wanted to write about. And I didn't know exactly what format this was going to take. I didn't know if it was going to be four people that at the end all know each other, three people that at the end all do something that's the same, but different, you know, like I, I really messed around with the format of this for quite a long time before settling on how it, how it ended up ended up uh, structuring itself. But some of the people I knew sort of of them, they were out, like, I knew their name, their name was sort of out there in the, in my, the, you know, peripheral vision, so to speak. Uh, but I didn't know very much about them or if they would be worth including. And so then some of those people, I spent years working on uh, researching their lives because they had not been well documented by other historians. Uh, and it, it took years of uncovering material on them. Well, one of the names I recognize from your Instagram feed, uh, Mr. Governor Morris. Mm -hmm. And I will say that, you know, coming from a TV background, uh, you immediately, you begin this book and there's, we're an action sequence. Like I, Mm -hmm. I'm moving, we're moving with Mm -hmm. Alexander Hamilton, uh, in what are his last few moments of, of life. Uh, and you introduce us to someone who's on his deathbed. 
that doesn't get much attention, except if you follow your Instagram account, uh, Governor <laughs> Morris. <laughs> and I will say I'm set to be in the Bronx next week. And now you've put visions in my head. Yeah. Um, you need Sharon, to visit. If, if you want to go into details. Um, mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about Governor Morris. Well, he's a, he's he's one of my pet subjects. Right. Like he I have a handful of people that I've like real interested in. Aaron Burr is one of them. Um, and so is Governor Morris. Governor Morris, however people say his name, it's pronounced both ways. Nobody knows. Um, he like what an interesting, interesting man. He is just he's in, incredibly intelligent. People like James Madison were like, we need to get somebody to write up portions of this of the constitution like the actual text of the constitution was constructed by and large by governor morris uh and people like james madison were like no one could have done a better job than him so he was he so was morris with, is the guy in the group project that is like handling the like the hard work yes like the, the logistics the rest of the dudes are like yeah what if we do like two houses in the congress what if we do two and then one's in there for two years one's there for six years and then there's one guy who's like yeah Okay. And he's the one, uh, you know, writing it all down in the language that the teacher will be happy with. Mm. Yes. So he's a great writer. He's well known in his own time. He's wealthy. He's this large, kind of larger than life personality. He was well known for being very jovial and, you know, uh, kind of bombastic. Uh, he's, he's a very tall and kind of portly, but he also is disabled. He loses his leg in a carriage accident at a, as a young man. He also had, um, a very severe burn accident where all of the skin on one of his arms was, uh, you know, came off from pulling down a pot of boiling water on himself. So he has these, uh, physical limitations that you don't really see. Uh, represented in U.S. history very much. Uh, you don't see uh, people with with uh, physical disabilities sort of elevated to a high status throughout history. And that's, of course, uh, to our detriment that we don't do those things. But. Well, and, and if I could stop you there, I mean, even Franklin Roosevelt hid yes. his disability. He had to hide it because the, uh, the judgment was so significant. Yes. Pretending like it's all good. Like, let's, would you guys contribute to build me a swimming pool? Because it's it really important for me to have a swimming pool at the house, at the <laughs> White House, so that I right. can swim. Um, and yeah, asking people to get him a swimming pool because of his, you know, he needs it for his health. Well, and asking the media to be complicit in the whole, like, we need to put forth an image to the country yeah. uh, that I am strong mm -hmm. and able. Totally. Well, Governor Morris was one of Alexander Hamilton's very, very best friends. And this is this is a, a founder pairing that you don't hear about very often. Right. You you hear a lot about sort of the big names of the Hamiltons and the Washingtons and the Jeffersons and the Madisons. The, the guys um, who got the big monuments in Washington. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But you don't hear about people like of Governor Morris very often. You probably wouldn't be able to pick his picture out of a lineup without a without a, you know, a, a, a caption underneath it. And yet he contributed as much, if not more, to the early republic than some of the other founders did. Uh, and it's time that we uncover these kinds of stories and bring them to light. You know, it's so interesting. We're talking here as uh, we're a couple months out from a presidential election. And there's, you know, this obsession with the president. Well, you know, for a good reason, right? Who's going to be the next president uh, and their role. But we, uh, we attach so much significance to who the next president's going to be. And it strikes me that this book is out uh, about, uh, you know, again, titled The Small and the Mighty, telling us the stories of people who, uh, at times, uh, I think several of these individuals probably had more impact on American history than some of the presidents that we've elected. Totally. Yeah. There are some people in here who achieve things that you're like, excuse me, what? Why have I never heard of this person's name? They did that. Is, that's incredible. You know, like there's a lot of no name presidents, right? Unless you're a history buff. I'm like, quick, what? what tell, tell me the policies of Martin Van Buren. And you're going to be like, is that the guy with the mutton chop sideburns that looks like right, a right. koala bear? They're, they're all known for one thing. Yeah. William Taft, yeah. uh, the guy with yeah. the bathtub. Like, you know, yes. there's, there's one thing that we know about, like pretty much the middle 25 presidents. Right. Which yeah. Harrison died 30 days into office? I forget. When which one was the grandson? You know, like, uh, and uh, that's there's many people in in history who held the office of the presidency who uh, probably did significantly less than some of these people. Yeah. So you tell us about some of these people. I learned uh, about Clara Brown for the first time. 
mm-hmm. the angel of the Rockies. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a, a bit of her story and the larger story that her experience uh, teaches us about uh, that era of American history. Well, Claire ba- Brown, Claire Brown was uh, one of the first female pioneers of Colorado Territory. She was almost certainly uh, one of the first uh, African Americans to step foot in Colorado Territory. She has been, you know, given this official designation as an official pioneer of this of this region. And, you know, Colorado, of course, is important in U.S. history for a variety of reasons. Mining, um, obviously, the mountains are important, but there's other reasons that Colorado is important. And but Colorado would not have been what it is without her. And she is a woman who grows up uh, enslaved and uh, finally gets her freedom as a, as an adult later in life. And of course she has a very, very uh, tragic life in many ways. Uh, She gets her freedom later in life and is, has completely become completely separated from her children and her spouse. She comes to learn that some of them have died, but she always holds on to hope that someday she will see at least one member of her family again. I mean, you described this tragic sequence where because of the slave owners, they literally sell off her children and her husband. Mm -hmm. In front of her, yes, and her, and they sell her as well. And I think there's this notion in American history that enslaved families got to stay together. They didn't. Uh, Enslaved families got to have agency over where they went and who they worked for. They didn't. Uh, it, It was a rarity that people even got to live with their significant other. Uh, very often, if you were married, you know, I'm saying that in air quotes, if you were married, you did not live together at the same uh, place in the same home or the same plantation. Um, and you saw each other probably only on Sundays, which was the only day that most enslaved people had off. And that was, again, assuming that they lived close enough that you could actually pay them a visit on Sundays. So this idea that, um, you know, there were quote unquote, happy, happy slaves. That's this, this trope in American history, mm-hmm. um, that enslaved people wanted to be kept in bondage, having no agency over their lives. That's just, that's just patently false. Um, but yes, she has to sit and watch her children be sold out um, from underneath her, watch her husband be sold. She's sold. And uh, eventually when she is freed, she goes on this quest to see, to find out what happens to her children and what happens to her husband. And along the way has a really, really significant impact on the American West. She becomes rich. She loses it all. I mean, it's a roller coaster following the story Mm -hmm. of Clara Brown. I'm like, Mm -hmm. wait, uh, this is going to be and happy. Oh no. (laughs) <laughs> Something, you know, we've taken a yes, turn. Yes. Oh, wait, it's happy mm-hmm. again. It's oh, not we've taken a, a straight, turn again. Yes. Yeah. You think to yourself, she's going to strike it rich in one of those Colorado silver mines. Like you, you, you know, sense this, uh, you know, these anticipatory moments uh, and it does not end up where you, the path does not travel the path you think it's going to. Yeah. I, I love your storytelling in here because you, you know, you have me hooked. And then you also talk about the way all these, you know, various historical figures intertwine, you know, mm-hmm. you know, they're on a train and it's like, oh, you might know this person because uh, they would go on to write a great American novel. This person would go to build one of the large businesses. They're all in the same place. Um, mm-hmm. And you're like, wow, you didn't have to make any of that up. Like history is yeah. remarkable like that. It it's uh, it is often truth is often stranger than fiction. That one is actually the, true. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> like you're you're describing the sequence where you have Rosenwald, uh, Sears. Some people mm-hmm. might be familiar with Sears. Uh, they go on to be a very successful one of the large, most successful uh, companies in American history. Um, mm-hmm. And then Booker T. Washington and uh, philanthropy and business. Uh, it. Tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, these figures uh, and the impact that this guy from Illinois, this guy, Sears, Booker T. Washington, and it was remarkable reading just um, how they get together and the larger impact they have mm. on American society, American history. Mm. Well, most people are familiar with at least the name Booker T. Washington, right? Like they understand who he is. He's a giant in, in African-American history. He started the Tuskegee Institute and he was famous in his own lifetime. So there's a lot of documentation about him. He's, you know, in the, on the front page of the New York Times, et cetera. So most people at least know who he is. Um, but 
What many people don't know is some of the intricacies of how he got to be who he was. Uh, And some of that had to do with befriending wealthy Northern philanthropists, including people like Julius Rosenwald, who I talk about in the book. And Julius Rosenwald is somebody who I really don't think has gotten his just desserts in history. Like what an interesting guy. Most people, unless they're really into, you know, business history or whatever, uh, would not know who he was, or unless you were in a certain very sort of small circles uh, where he was, you know, held up as an example. But he didn't I had, put his name on enough universities no, and buildings, Sharon. No, That's usually he, that's right. Where we know Carnegie and Rockefeller, That's right. right? Exactly. Yeah. You you see the libraries and all of the things that these other men lent their names to. And Rosenwald intentionally fought against that when a museum wanted to name call itself the Rosenwald Museum because he was a substantial uh, uh, contributor. He fought. He actually fought them to take his name off the building because he didn't want that to be his legacy. So I I love that he. Um, he should be in, you know, he should be on the, our list of names of philanthropic greats in the United States, but he sort of, he wanted to fade into obscurity. He made sure to give away all of his money, which he gives away the modern day equivalent of over a billion dollars. Um, and he does it almost all during his lifetime. He refuses to die with money. Uh, and what money he did have, you know, to pay for his living expenses, et cetera. When he dies, he gives instructions that you need to distribute this money to the various causes that I have uh, laid out, and it all needs to be distributed to them within a certain lifetime. I do, or within within a certain time frame. I don't want my name going on this fund in perpetuity where we're like, oh, the Julius Rosenwald Fund that's been around for the last one hundred years. He didn't want that. He didn't see any value in tying up his money into these foundations that exist to self-perpetuate. That was his perspective, was that all of these philanthropists were interested in this sort of self-perpetuation, like I want to be immortal via my money. Uh, And he was not interested in that. And I just, what he chooses to do with his money, I will save as a surprise for the readers. But what he chooses to do with his money is I... When I first found out about this, I was stunned. I was stunned that that is what he chose to do. And I had never heard of it as a as a student of history for my since I was an adolescent. I'd never, ever heard that before. Um, and to me, that was that was one of the most ex- sort of exciting discoveries that I made when I was writing this. Yeah, and I, I will say as a, as a student of history, I knew I had never heard of Julius Rosenwald, mm-hmm. uh, his connection to Sears growing up down the street from the Lincolns. There's a certain Lincoln family yeah. from Illinois that people are familiar with. Yeah. Uh, and what he did and the impact that it has, it's, it's a remarkable story. Um, one of the things you do in this book too, is you take things that we all take for granted or we're aware of, uh, and you, uh, try to uh, tell us the story behind them. One mm-hmm. is the song America the Beautiful, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, something that, uh, you know, we know very well. It's played at many sporting events. Uh, and you uh, tell us a bit of a story about the woman who wrote it. And I, I have to say, I admit, I've never thought about who wrote America the Beautiful. And it's so mm-hmm. interesting because the Star Spangled Banner, Francis Scott Key. Like, yeah. you know that. So many America things the- named after him. Correct. Bridges. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, uh, it, you know, a high quarter schools. The state of yes. Maryland, Go to Maryland. And across the country. That's right. Um, actually, in fact, there was a dormitory at GW, George Washington University, where I attended college. That was FSK Hall. Yes. Um, that I almost lived in. America the Beautiful, though, written, you tell us the story of, of Katie Bates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Katie Bates grew up um, in small town in Massachusetts. And uh, her father died when she was a baby. And her mother worked hard as a single mom to try to provide for her children. Katie is really, really smart. She's always been smart. She writes in her little journals. And that's kind of what she does for fun. And her older, she's the youngest child. And her older siblings are like, oh, no, we get to we get to do all the work while she just sits under the lilac bushes and drawing pictures and writing in her yeah, little you, journal. You, you have a very good description in your book of, <laughs> of what it's like to be the youngest child. Sharon, mm-hmm. where did you fall in your... I'm in, the oldest. Um, you're I'm the, the oldest. oldest. Mm-hmm. I am mm-hmm. also the oldest. Mm-hmm. 
we have certain expectations. Mm-hmm. The youngest, uh-huh. they, they get away with some stuff. They get away with all the things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as a parent of multiple children, I can, and my older kids are like, this youngest child gets away with everything. I'm like, I'm sorry. It's how it is. It's the way of the world. <laughs> anyway. As, as, as you write in the book, mom is tired. Mom is tired. Mom yeah. cannot care about all of these things simultaneously. So mom's tired. So Katie gets away with so much, but she even writes in her little journals when she's a young child um, that her she doesn't understand why girls have to just spend all their lives sewing. Why do girls have to do all the sewing? And her fondest wish is that she could uh, read and read and read and learn and learn and learn and know and know and know. And that was like the sort of the wishes of her, her heart were to just be able to continue to know things and learn things. So she goes on to um, study at Wellesley, which is a brand new school when she starts attending college there. Part of the chain of seven sisters colleges that were designed to be sort of the Ivy League equivalent schools for women, because the Ivy League schools did not admit women at the time. She went goes on to study at Wellesley. And uh, there's been a lot made of Katie Bates's relationship with a woman named Catherine Homan, who she lived with for decades. Mm. Uh, there was a, um, you know, a, a, sort of a phenomenon during this time period at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, where uh, women uh, lived with other women and they were, mo- you know, very likely um, in same sex relationships, but we didn't have those kinds of, they didn't have those kinds of, um, language, uh, expectations, um, uh, you know, that we would now, and people would call that called them and people called these sort of relationships, Boston marriages, because they mm. seemed to happen most frequently in the, in New- the new England area. So she has this long relationship with this woman and the story of how she comes to write America the Beautiful is is really interesting. Katie was raised, or Katie's father was a minister, as I mentioned, but she has struggled her entire life with her faith. She doesn't, she wishes she could believe something, but doesn't really know what that is. And her um, longtime companion is a woman of great faith. She has very strong beliefs, and she admires that in her. So when you read the lyrics to America the Beautiful, you can see um, how Katie was writing about her fondest wish for her fondest wishes for America, describing the beauty of the land and its people and casting a vision. Uh, Often it's a vision that involves some kind of higher being, involves God, um, Casting a vision for what America will be in the future. And this aspirational vision of the country. Yes, that's right. That's right. And the thing that I think is so interesting about how this how this gets written, she does not set out to write any kind of a uh, any kind of an anthem. Um, it's probably as close to an American hymn as we have. But she doesn't set out with that vision. But she made a sum total of five dollars for america the beautiful during her entire lifetime she made five dollars and that was for the original printing of what was first a poem Mm. the same way that um the star spangled banner was first a poem uh that was then later set to music she submitted it to a, a church magazine the congregationalist her father was a congregationalist minister she submits it to a church magazine And they accept it for publication on July 4th and they pay her $5. And since then she granted nearly every single reprint request and never took a penny for any of her uh, reprints. She could have died a wealthy woman and chose not to. How big was America the Beautiful by the time of her death? Did she realize how- Huge, huge. It was huge. It had gotten huge Oh, it was huge. Yes, it was huge. Um, The- the just keeping up with her correspondence by the time that she died was nearly a full-time job. She had to have assistance keeping up with her correspondence. Uh, it, it was a, it was viral before, you know, anybody knew what that term meant. The, the poem was, ex- the poem and later the song were extremely popular. Um, even before 
America designates, officially designates the Star Spangled Banner as the national anthem, which, which happened during the Hoover presidency. Um, there was a strong, um, movement to make America the beautiful, the national anthem, where people formed like the, um, the National Hymn Society tried to make a case. So there's like, a full on competition. And this is something people don't realize, you know, until Herbert Hoover, until the 20th century, we don't, uh, the Star Spangled Banner is not a national anthem. And I guess no. there's a, what you're describing here is a competition of like team, you know, team Star Spangled team Banner. America the beautiful. Team America the Beautiful. Yes. Yes. And also the, there's also the, in there the story of how we get the, the, how we get the music to America the Beautiful, which people can read about. But there's there's also a competition for that. There's also a huge competition that gets a, over a thousand entries uh, for the to create a melody for America the Beautiful. It's it's like many of these things in American history that again, you know, you look at your currency these days, you see in God we trust, and you're like, you know, and you just kind of always assume all these things, you know, were always there. It's always been there. And you know, that's the case where that's only been here since the 1950s. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Because uh, the because the communists, but we can talk about that another day. <laughs> because of those godless commies over the there in the Soviet Union. We here in the U.S. We, we're going to put God on our money to That's show right. how much we're into God here. To uh, show how much would, we're into capitalism, <laughs> right? Like the irony there. There's something really rich, well, metaphorically and literally, and putting like God's name on our money. That's right. Um, you introduce us to a lot of remarkable women, and through the telling of these stories. You uh, take us back to various points in American history that I have to say, like, wow, I knew things were bad, but what? Page 116, <laughs> Sharon, I like to turn the class's attention, mm-hmm. where I, <laughs> it's reinforced to me, uh, what was going on in Idaho, among other things, you note, and you repeat it in the book, you're like, the age of consent for women, or I should say girls, is 10 years old mm-hmm. in Idaho in 1890, as you tell us the story of Rebecca Brown Mitchell. Mm-hmm. 10. 10 years old. And she was like, that's not right. We should change that. And it requires a considerable amount of work on her part to change the age of consent away from 10. Right? So that just gives you an idea when people ask you, Mo, and I know they do, is this the worst it's ever been? The people Do people ask you this? Is this the Every worst day, America's Sharon, ever been? Every day on Instagram. You know, yes, it just it feels just like I was like, worst. let me take you back to Idaho in 1890, yeah. where, um, you know, 10 year old girls were mm-hmm. being, you know, mm-hmm. married off. And that woman that we're talking about, Rebecca Brown Mitchell, also, uh, she's a young widow. And when she she started out her life in Illinois and when her husband dies, leaving her alone with two young sons, she has no legal right to any of their possessions except for their family Bible. Mm. Everything they owned as a family, including her clothes and the clothing that belonged to her children, the literal clothes on their back, she had no legal right to. And if she wanted to keep, she had to purchase back from the state of Illinois. So no, no, things are not things. This is not the worst it's ever been. If your husband dies, uh, it's assumed that you will be the inheritor of the house and the contents of the house and the life insurance policy. But she, she refers to it uh, as being in the iron cage of the law that she feels. And this is also during a time period in Illinois where the laws are so anti-woman that a man could literally uh, decide one day that his wife is too much trouble. She's too opinionated. She's too mouthy um, and take her to an insane asylum and have her forcibly committed without her consent. Uh, just And just say to the people there, she's crazy. You got to take her uh, and have her forcibly committed. Uh, And also in the same time period, same place, women had no legal custody rights to their children. Uh, Men had all of the legal custody rights uh, when women would uh, would be abandoned or divorced or committed to an insane asylum. They had no legal uh, method to pursue being granted custody of their own children. So once again, no. This is not the worst it's ever been. It's not in America, though. Sadly, no. some of the things you describe still True. exist uh, in certain parts of the world, in yes. the Middle East uh, mm-hmm. and, and Africa in, in some places. But the Rebecca Brown Mitchell story, I think, is, is so interesting because you also um, remind us uh, you're talking about the, the suffragist movement, the, the, the push mm-hmm. for multiple decades for women to get the right to vote. She's out there out west and uh, she's talking about, hey, Idaho, let's join Wyoming, Utah, Colorado and give women the 
the right to vote. And that's one of the remarkable things in history. What was happening out there? Why is it that those states, which, you know, incidentally, some of those states today are among the reddest, the more conservative of the states, mm-hmm. tended to be the most progressive, especially when it came to women's rights in that Yeah, era. Yeah, it's an interesting question that I've asked myself, too. Like, why is it Idaho? Why Idaho and Wyoming? Why are you guys the first? And all mm-hmm. of these states that you associate with, like, more quote unquote, progressive ideologies, they're not among the first. There's a few reasons. One is that they wanted to increase their populations. uh, And in order to increase their populations, they needed more settlers so that they could become a state. They actually mm. needed like more people to get on board. So these are all the, these were the territories of Wyoming, yes, Idaho. Yes. At the time. Yeah. Yep. And so uh, they they thought to themselves, in some cases, if we grant women the right to vote here, um, we will be able to gain statehood more easily and we will attract people to moving here. Uh, if women have rights here, there will be a certain subset of people who are like, yes, I want to go where I can be equal in the eyes of the law. Uh, and so that might attract more settlers. I, I say in the book, it's like in the, uh, in the, in the, you know, movie classic, my big fat Greek wedding, mm-hmm. uh, the, Men may be the head of the household, but the women are the neck. And so the idea that like (laughs) women could steer their spouse into being like, you know, where it might be good. It might be nice out there in Wyoming. They have some nice, very nice views of those mountains. So that, that is one of the reasons. Another reason is just that you have to look at who is actually settling these places. Uh, these are a different breed of human in many cases. Uh, the tidewater planters of Virginia, by and large, are not the same people who are pioneering Idaho. And of course, we are completely leaving Native American groups out of this specific um, phenomenon, migratory phenomenon that I'm referring to. But these are not the same type of individuals. There's a lot more sort of laissez-faire, live and let live. Everybody can do what they want. Yeah, it's fine with me if they vote. It's a different kind of person that tended to move out west uh, than who tended to live in these very tightly controlled uh, communities that had very structured caste systems. One of the remarkable things, and I, I don't think I've ever thought about it this way, but they're basically like, okay, ladies, uh, you want to vote? Get the guys, convince the yep. guys to let you vote. That ultimately... <laughs> That was that was the movement was yes. convincing the men. Yes. What, what turned out to be the more effective arguments uh, that Mitchell and others ended up using to convince mm. the men in their lives to grant them the right to vote? Well, the, they're, they use a different a variety of tactics. Right. Uh, and you see that the tactics vary depending on geography. But one of the things that um, Mitchell and other women who were working for suffrage in Idaho do is they stand outside all of the polling places with coffee and snacks. And they hold signs that encourage the men to vote for the, the constitutional amendment uh, granting women suffrage. But they man coffee stations, or I should say, they woman the coffee stations, Mosh. Uh, and we have a the way, coffees. Uh, a way to get the vote is through your stomach. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, that's right. Uh, they hire children. They hire little boys. Like, we'll pay you 50 cents or whatever amount uh, if you stand outside the polling place with a sign that says, vote for your mother. So mm. they they played on people's emotions um, because not granting women the right to vote is really not based in logic, right? right. It's based in it's based on a, an emotional perception uh, that women are less than. It's not based on logic. So they, they were not going to be able to... They had not been successful in making logical arguments. They needed to make an emotional one. And this is an interesting fact that I don't know that a lot of people know, is that today we're very familiar with voting, where you go in, you get your ballot, um, there's ba- there's poll workers that work for the state, and they make sure everything's on the up and up, here's your, take your thing, fill out the bubbles, there you go. Um, at the at, In the past, that is not how it worked. People could like people who wanted to be on the ballot could literally make up their own ballots and then they would stand there or put boxes of them at the polling place and people could just pick up the ballot that they wanted. And they're essentially doing the equivalent of like signing their name to this ticket. I like the Sharon and Mosh ticket. I'm going to pick that up, sign my name, turn Don't that Don't say in. this too loudly, Sharon. <laughs> no, Rudy Giuliani that thinks part. that happened in 2020. Cut that part. Um, <laughs> uh, 
you would pick up the ballot that you wanted and sign your name to it mm. or fill out the, you know, uh, put a mark next to it and then turn that in. It was not one master ballot. And so you can even see that reflected in some of the quotes where the men who are walking past the women with the coffee and the donuts, they're like, it's not my ticket. It's not my ticket. Meaning I'm not going to take your ticket that has this thing on it so that and sign my name to it. So voting has changed. The structure of how we used to vote has changed uh, dramatically, even in the last 150 years. You also, you know, through some of these stories, tell us um, a bit of what was happening uh, within relationships at the time. You know, one of the things we look at when we look at the constitutional amendment uh, amendments is like, oh, yeah, two of them. One of them is uh, to ban uh, is prohibition, you know, ban alcohol. And then, you know, a decade later, plus, you know, we we make alcohol legal again. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't realize the connection between the suffragist movement and the temperance movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, given what was happening with with men and women in society and why women um, were really, you know, a number of them were into the temperance movement because of basically how men were behaving. Yes, yes. The temperance and suffrage are, they are just branches of the same tree. They, they are ideas that grow at the same time. They are ir- inextricably intertwined with each other. And uh, the temperance movement got started because women were being mistreated in society. Uh, as, as we began to consolidate into cities, into the larger cities, and we were lived in less spread out conditions, um, the proliferation of drinking establishments coincided with that you know, saloons and bars and these types of things. Right. And that became something, you know, this is still true in a lot of America's small cities is that there's nothing else to do here except drink. Right. Mm. There's no, all that's in this small town is a gas station and a bar. It's not that uncommon in a lot of places. So, um, the bar became a place for the men to socialize. And, uh, as cities grew there, it became easier and easier and easier to, to access these types of establishments. Well, there were no social safety nets. There are very few social safety nets. And so when a man would get his wages, his week's wages on Friday, and he would go out on Friday evening to the bars um, and and then drink and gamble all evening, um, he too often was drinking and gambling away the money that was supposed to be feeding his chil- his wife and children. Hmm. And then he would come home intoxicated on a Friday night and subject his wife and children to abuse. Um, there was next to nothing that women could do about this. Um, it was in most places, it was next to impossible to leave your spouse. Either it was legally impossible or it was next to impossible to be a single parent and provide for your children. There were just so many jobs that were not available to women. It was very challenging to be a single parent and provide for your kids. And it still is, but it was even more challenging then. So uh, it, it was logistically impossible in many cases for women to leave their spouses. And so in their view, if we could get rid of these bars, if we get rid of the saloons, uh, we would solve a lot of these issues of poverty and abuse. That was the intention Getting rid of poverty and abuse. Well, of course, women who wanted to end uh, poverty and abuse for women and children also wanted women to have equal rights and be able to vote. These are one in the same uh, group of people. Uh, And some people cared a lot more about temperance than others did. But nevertheless, you cannot deny that these two movements are uh, inextricably linked. So you tell us about this, the 12 unsung Americans, uh, but it wouldn't be a, a book of yours if you didn't include an animal or That's two. right. That's right. Uh, you, Thank you for you, noticing. Uh, listen, I, <laughs> you know, I follow your conference for years and I was like, I'm waiting for the animal story. Yeah, thank and you for noticing. Then, then I'm, I meet Cher Ami, the pigeon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. You tell it's us a about a, a pigeon who, who, who like in, in the annals of American history, saved several hundred Americans. Yes, it's a good story. I love Cher. I find this, I fought with my editors about this. My editors were like, we don't need the pigeons. I'm like, we absolutely need the pigeons. <laughs> this is a pigeon who's, yeah. who's an American hero. Uh, an American hero. That's absolutely yeah. right. Um, my editors were like, but it's it's just a bird. I'm like, you watch your mouth. 
Okay, why, watch your mouth. Uh, it, just a bird. Uh, I I fought to keep that bird in there, and I won. I fought the law, and the law won. No, um, I just the, the story of Cher Ami, who is presumed to be a girl pigeon, but in yeah. reality is ends up being a boy pigeon that discovered later in life. Um, it's such an interesting story, and also. The, this is one of those things where I just, I was like so amused that there is a United States pigeoneering service. Like mm-hmm. there are people whose job it is to be pigeoneers, Mosh. That was a whole thing. We, we eventually employed thousands of pigeons in World War One. <laughs> just have way, we're talking about World War One. We have since yes. updated our technology in the American military. We don't use pigeons most anymore. Presume, nice pigeon. But World War One pigeons. Were the, pigeons were, were, a new, were the drones of yesteryear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we used actual pigeons. We carried pigeons in a basket backpack. Uh, it was like you know, like picture a basket with some leather straps on it, and there's a lid on the basket, and you'd you'd put several pigeons in this backpack as you're leaving to go on your mission, um, and then you'd also bring along these little you know strips of paper. And you could write a message on a strip of paper and affix it around the pigeon's foot and take the pigeon out and be like, okay, fly home, little buddy. And (laughs) Tell them we need help. Yes. Give them the message. And the pigeons are uh, exceptionally good at finding home. And they had this policy of you do not feed the pigeons. You may never feed the pigeons because the pigeon has to learn that the only place it can get food is at its roost. And its roost Mm. is with the pigeon keepers in the United States Army. Also, the British Army used pigeons. Um, You want that pigeon a little bit hungry so that it is it has an incentive to try to get home. Listen, I do not know how animals migrate. It has something to do with electromagnetic fields of the earth. But that's still real weird to me that a bird can be like a little to the left now. You know what I mean? Like I don't and you're you're seeing these markers from so far above. I don't understand how you navigate, but they do. They really they just do. It's like how do whales go from Alaska to Hawaii every year in the dark water with no landmarks? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but it's interesting. And I should say, you know, and you are sort of a, you know, uh, a, a ornithologist on the side, given your your love of, of birds. I do love birds. I love you know. the birds and the whales. Um, I do. And so I don't know how they navigate, but they do. And they find their way back and they deliver the messages and they save people's lives and they become heroes and they go to the Smithsonian. Yeah. Share, share the pigeon. You can meet Share the Pigeon at the Smithsonian. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, you know, t- taking gunfire from the Germans, saving American soul. You know, it's one of those loses stories. Loses a leg. Loses a leg. It's mm-hmm. incredible. This mm-hmm. pigeon, what this pigeon overcomes to save mm-hmm. the troops. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I was not expecting to learn this story. And and yet here we are. Are you like when you walk around the Smithsonian, are you looking for like that nook in a corner somewhere? You know, they put all the stuff in the museums and there's the big exhibits and it's always like this little caption with a little thing in the corner. Are you looking for those stories? Oh. And it was, as you went through this process, are you walking around the Smithsonian being like, there's got to be some rich stuff in here that's like oh. stuck on the third floor in the corner somewhere? Listen, I love a, I love an old museum. I love a quirky museum that somebody just, you know, like, yeah, my grandpa had some stuff in his garage and they make like a museum out of it. Mm-hmm. I love a weird roadside attraction. Um, I went to one yesterday, in fact, which is a re- like a remnant of a logging camp. Uh, and they have like little remakes of like, here's what it was like to eat breakfast at the logging camp. And it, they have these mannequins that are terribly done. Uh, it's just that kind of stuff amuses me greatly. So, yes, I think it's cool to see the giant, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton, et cetera. But I find far more interesting the weird stuff that has been there for 75 years. Um, those are the stories that have always amused me. So perhaps that is, it's not actually that big of a stretch that the, those kinds of stories are also the subject of my book. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that big uh, of a stretch. <laughs> so, um, we, you know, we went through a few of the folks, we're going to save, save some stuff for the book, uh, small and mighty by Sharon McMahon here. Uh, but I will end with the question you're pretty familiar with Sharon. If mm. people listen to your podcast, they know that 
you like to ask people when the reader mm. finishes the last page and closes the book, what is it that you would like them to know? Mm. Well, there's a few things, but one of the things that I would like people to know is that um, great Americans live, right? These are not just black and white pictures of the past, that these are not just stories of the long ago and we have no hope of becoming one ourselves, that you too can be a great American. You just have to decide to be one. Uh, and these people in this book show us a variety of different paths that one can take to make such an incredible difference, to change the course of history. So I don't, I love this idea that um, great Americans live and you can be one of them. And there will come a point and sub point in your life when all of your life experiences, all of the hardships and the trials and the tribulations that you have been through, those are all becoming part of your character. And at some point in your life, the character that you have been forming will be called upon and you will either have to move forward with courage or you will turn back. And for some people, that moment is fast approaching. For some people, you don't know it yet, but it's almost here. And for some people, that moment is now. And I hope that when that moment comes, that you'll rise to it and that these will be um, a familiar, you know, sort of common set of ancestors that we can all share, people that we can look to and say, man, if they did it, so can I. I can just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah, many of these people weren't looking to make history. No. They were just living their lives. They, most of them were not. Nobody went in with a 12-step plan of like, I have the plan. Here's how we're going to fix it. Most people were literally just doing the doing the next needed thing, doing what was in front of them to the best of their ability. Um, they did not say to themselves, well, I can't fix everything. So until I'm capable of making systemic change to the inequalities of society, I'm going to do nothing whatsoever. Um, imagine if our ancestors waited until they were uh, financially secure to do something worth doing, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that, that many modern Americans have like, well, it's just so hard to make a living today. I don't really have time to do X, Y, and Z. I'm not denying that it's hard to make a living. It can't very much can be. Um, but very few of our ancestors who did really incredible things had that criteria. Uh, they did not wait until they felt like, wow, everything's great. And all my kids are healthy and alive. I have no physical problems. I don't have a peg leg. <laughs> I have tons of money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, our, an our great ancestors did not wait for the situation to be perfect. They just kept doing the next needed thing. You say there's a lesson also about failure. I think back to our, our, our favorite here, Rebecca Brown Mitchell. Um, and, uh, and I think you, you write about the, the lessons we can all take from people who are, are willing to fail and the mm -hmm. nature of failure in, in itself. Mm. Yeah. The, I, I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about the fear of failure, like, Oh, I'm afraid to fail. I don't necessarily know that it's true because we, we fail at things all the time that aren't a big deal to us. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's not so much that we're afraid to fail. It's that we're afraid to have other people watch us fail, right? It's the, what if I start the business and then the people talk about me behind my back if it doesn't do well? Right. Uh, what if I start an Instagram account and the people who made fun of me in high school are still making fun of me in their group texts? What if that, and they are going to make fun of me if it fails the, I think this idea that it's not so much being afraid to fail as it is other people laughing at you or judging you when you fail. That's what we have to move past. Uh, if you think about like, let's say you were, if you were going to go to the Olympics, just as a common man, Moshe, just as, as, just as you today, oh, well, um, I, and, based, based on the most recent Olympics, I'm thinking about break dancing at the, yeah, at, that, at yes. Point. Australian break dancing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what did that, what is, you know, what's the lesson from the Australian break dancer? It's, it's that people watching you fail is what's brutal. Yeah. Right. If she had just come in last and nobody noticed. That might have been a personal amount of angst of like, oh, man, I really wanted to win a medal and I didn't. You might feel personally upset about it. But what really stings is other people watching you fail. 
Mm-hmm. So I think that's what holds so many of us back. But the people who have gone on to do incredible things have the audacity to not care about other people watching them fail. That That is a theme of our friend Carlos Whitaker's new book too, Reconnected, if you've... Mm-hmm. Um, we just had him on the podcast in the last week mm-hmm. um, talking about his experience, actually, Sharon. I wonder if you're intrigued about it. A seven weeks cold turkey, no social media, no technology. Is mm-hmm. that something you're considering after this book tour? <laughs> Listen, uh, you know what sounds real, real good right about now is just like a, a porch on uh, Nantucket. Mm-hmm. Uh, just looking at the little whale spouts in the distance and some poetry. working on my needlepoint, <laughs> Li- literally working on my needlepoint, knitting, knitting a sweater, uh, drinking some tea, some iced tea, arranging my hydrangeas. It sounds real good. It's a, that sort of soft life. It doesn't sound bad. You know, I, I, but getting to the previous point in, in all seriousness, as we talk about, um, again, like the election, we, you and I both hear from people all the time who are frustrated, who ask whether it's the worst era ever. What can I do? You know, this party sucks and that party sucks and I don't like anybody. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of, um, you know, you, you try to basically put up the mirror uh, with this book for people saying, you know, you, you could do something as well. And I think people probably are asking you and will be asking you on this book tour, like, Sharon, what, what can I do? What can I do? Mm. Things seem mm-hmm. so bad. And, uh, you know, I'm just waiting on the state or the, the my local authorities or the feds to, you know, fix this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we have this innate desire that somebody else needs to fix it. Like that there needs to be some person on a white horse with the plan. Mm-hmm. And we need to be able to rally behind the leader with the plan. And let me tell you, historically, that has not ended well. The man, the man with the plan is almost always a, wants to be a dictator, right? Like the plan almost always ends up with a large, with as bad news for large numbers of marginalized groups. The man with the plan uh, is historically not, uh, it does not actually have a very good plan. Uh, instead, uh, I think it's important to remember that we are the plan, right? That it's not a man with the plan, that it's the plan is us, that we are the plan and that it's incumbent on each of us to do what we can, where we are with the resources mm-hmm. available to us. For some of us, we're going to have massive platforms and the ability to raise $10 million or the ability to be on, you know, work for a major news outlet. Some of us are going to have different resources than other people. Uh, and that's actually not just that, that that's actually a good thing. Some people need to be working in the preschools. Some people need to be civil engineers. Some people need to be uh, working for the Department of Energy. We all, like, what we're do- each doing is important. Some people need to volunteer at their local precinct on election day yes, to that's right. you know, help people vote. That's exactly right. Uh, all of us can do something. Nobody can do it all, but all of us can do something. And it might as well be the next needed thing. I think of no better way to end this podcast than with that right there, Sharon. Thank you. And uh, Mm. good luck with the book. Thank you. Uh, It's such a great pleasure to see you. And I'm so grateful for your time.